Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of light. Who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain. Who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We sing praises to your name. Oh, Lord, praises to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. We sing praises to your name. Oh, Lord, praises to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. We give glory to your name. Oh, Lord, glory to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. We give glory to your name, O Lord, glory to your name, O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. Let's pray together. Father God, we do give praise to your name. We're so thankful for this day. We're thankful for this time that we have to come together to fellowship with other Christians, other believers, to spend time together singing songs of praise to you, to learning more about your will for us, and we're just uh, we're thankful on this Independence Weekend that we have a country where we can come together, gather freely without fear, uh, and and do these, take take part in this worship service, and uh, and openly worship you without any fears of, or threats of retaliation. And Father, we're thankful for all the people that that have um, went out and 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 really lived and died to give us that freedom. And, and uh, Father, we pray that our, our leaders um, will make wise decisions for our country, that we can, um, we can be a, a, a country that looks to you and loves you and, and seeks wisdom from you. And Father, um, it's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen. I do want to take a second, and, and since it is the day before uh, the 4th of July, and just thank all the, all the folks that have served our country, and, it's, and just want to Ask anyone who served in the military, uh, or even maybe it was a spouse of someone who served in the military. That's a, a huge commitment. Take, take a second and just stand. And if there's anyone here that served our country, thank you. We owe, we owe you a debt of gratitude. 
Let's continue our, uh, our worship by singing. Uh, if it's convenient, we'll ask you to stand and sing the, the next two songs. If it's convenient, I'll ask you to stand and sing the next two songs. <laughs> Holy Lord, most holy Lord, you alone are worthy of my praise. O oh, holy Lord, most holy Lord, with all of my heart I sing. All of my heart I sing. Great are you, Lord, worthy of praise. Great are you, Lord, most holy Lord. Holy Lord, most holy Lord, you alone are worthy of my praise. O oh, holy Lord, most holy Lord, with all of my heart I sing. All of my heart I sing. Great are you, Lord. Most holy Lord, great are you, Lord, worthy of praise, holy and true, great are you, Lord, most holy of the world, you step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see, beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you, here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. King of all days, all so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for our sake became poor. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. And I'll never know how much it cost To see my sin upon the cross I'll never know how much it cost To see when the feast divine is Hearts are brought in closer union while partaking of the bread. Precious feast, all else surpassing wondrous love for you and me. While we feast, Christ gently whispers 
Do this in my memory. God so loved what wondrous measure loved and gave the best of heaven bought us with that matchless treasure yea for us his life was given precious feast all else surpassing wondrous love for you and me while we feast Christ gently whispers do this in my memory feast divine all else surpassing precious blood for you and me while we sup Christ gently whispers do this in my memory precious feast all else surpassing wondrous love for you and me while we feast Christ gently whispers, do this in my memory. Does everybody have a communion cup? <clears throat> if not, we can send one out to you. Just raise your hand. Everybody good to go. Okay. Well, we've come to the point in our service where we remember the, <clears throat> excuse me, the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for us, and in his death, that we may have the opportunity of eternal life and home with him and God one day. Um, so if you'll go with me, um, and thanks to God for the bread. Dear Lord, we come to you now asking your blessing upon this bread that represents your son's broken body on the cross. And we ask you that as we take this emblem, that we remember that sacrifice that was made for us and realize the significance that it had to give us the opportunity to have an eternal life and home in heaven with you one day. So please bless this bread and be with us. In Christ's name, amen. Go to God in prayer again for the cup. Dear Lord, we come to you again asking your blessing upon this cup of juice that represents your son's shed blood on the cross that was given for us. We ask you to help us partake of it in a manner, manner that is pleasing and worthy in your sight in honor of him. In Christ's name, amen. Now, separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, this is a convenient time for us to take up a collection of donations to help spread the work of the church in the local community and give to those less fortunate than us. Um, I believe um, there's a way to give online, but you can also give in a tray on the way out the door here today, whichever is more convenient for you. So let's go to God in prayer for that. Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity for us all to come here and worship you together safely today. Lord, we know that this is the weekend of our nation's Independence Day and that we're celebrating that. And we help you, uh, ask you to help keep us mindful of the blessings that we have that many around the world do not have. That it, those blessings are not afforded to them. The ability to come and openly worship you uh, freely and without fear of persecution, the ability to simply be here today, the ability to have shelter over our heads, food on our tables. We also recognize that 
Well, there are many around the world that do not have these things. There are many right here in our community that also don't have those things and aren't given the same blessings that we are given. We ask you to put us in a situation to help all of those people, no matter where they may be, and help use us as a tool, as your tool, to help spread the blessings that you've given us throughout our communities and throughout this world. Lord, we ask you to be with us as we leave this place today and go our separate ways. Stay with us and keep us safe until the next opportunity that we have to come together. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. And I'll give you guys major props for getting that back up and running so quickly. Appreciate it. Um, go ahead and looks like the kids already know and the teachers already know. We'll invite them to make their way out to uh, their classes. And I think there's a couple of slides with announcements. I'm not sure. Maybe not. All right. Very good. Well, let's, um, before Steve brings our lesson this morning, I think it's almost mandatory that we stand if it's convenient for our God. He is alive. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tinted skies with heavenly hue and framed the worlds with his great might. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live and we survive. From dust our God, from dust our God, created man, he is our God, the great I am. There was a long, long time, time ago, a God whose voice the prophets heard, he is the God that we should know, who speaks from his inspired word. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live and we survive. From dust our God, from dust our God, created man, he is our God, the great I am. Secure is life from mortal mind, God holds the germ within his hands, though man may search they cannot find for god alone does understand there is a god he is alive in him we live and we survive from dust our god from dust our god created man he is our God, the great I am. Our God, whose son upon a tree, a life was willing there to give, that he from sin might set men free, and evermore with him could live. There is a God, He is alive, in Him we live, and we survive. From dust our God, created man, He is our God, the great I Am. Please be seated. So when you used to go to the mall, you would get these little maps around that would say, you know, you are here. And so I want to start with that. Um, I've been here for a little bit now, um, filling in. And uh, we began right in the bullseye. 
the bullseye is the passion of Christ. Uh, so we talked about uh, everything that happened that Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That was the, that's the bullseye of it. And then we began to move out from that, still talking about the bullseye, but talking about different ways of understanding how the cross saves us. Yes, the cross saves us. And it's very important that we understand that and accept that. That's what it means to be Christian. Um, but we may have differing understandings of exactly how the cross saves us. And so we looked at a few uh, predominant ideas from there. So as we're moving out from that very core part, uh, there's a number of different ways that we can go. Uh, one of the ways that we could go, the way that I'm choosing at least for now to go, I may go back later, but uh, one of the ways I'm choosing to go now is to say, let's look at what happened in the development of the canon itself, the development of uh, Scripture. And so what I might do here uh, is to begin them and do them in the order in which they appear to be written. And I'm doing that a little bit except that I'm leaving off the one that I think is the first written because we're studying that on Sunday morning in class, and that is the book of James. And so the second one in order that I think comes around is the book of Galatians. And so that's where I want to turn to is in Galatians. Our text today will be the first nine verses of Galatians, which I'll read in a minute after just kind of setting it up a little bit. Galatians is a very interesting book for uh, people of my uh, pigment persuasion. Um, because the Galatians themselves, uh, at least one portion of the Galatians, these are the Celts. And uh, many of us would um, translate our uh, lineage. Our lineage would go back to Celtish people. Now you have to understand the Celts were never a nation as such. We're really talking about tribes. And with these Galatians are not the tribes that we typically think of when we think of the Celts. Um, the Celts are more up into the European area, but the Celts did spread east, and there is a group of them, and um, by the way, Gaul, France, so this is kind of the area where you are, Gaul, the people from, uh, the people of that like who lived in Gratia, and so Gaul and Gratia kind of comes together and it becomes Galatia, and so that's the, the Gauls in this particular region of the world. It's it's kind of the easternmost reach of the, of the Celtic people. Not that everyone that lived there was Celtic, don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying that's kind of a, a way that we might connect it in our minds. This is the sort of people uh, that we have there. Um, just to give it a minute, there's sort of a northern Galatian area, which is sort of the ethnic Galatians, the people that we would think of as actually being the Celts. Actually, I think this book is written to southern Galatia, which is not where uh, your ethnic Celtic people lived, but it's the part that gets taken over when Rome takes them over. So Rome takes them over and you got this southern part, which we oftentimes refer to as Phrygian. And so you got the Phrygian Galatian area, basically it's talking about southern and northern Galatia, uh, an area that is ethnically Galatian, related to the Celts, and an area to the bottom that is not ethnically Galatian, but it becomes that way in terms of uh, government, and it becomes a province there. You can read the historic journey here. I don't want to get into it today, but basically in Acts 13 and 14, you're getting the, um, the spread of the gospel through uh, southern Galatia, and that's where Paul talks to a number of people there. And in the context there, which is always so important to get, the context is that these people in southern Galatia have not been long Roman. They have not been long Roman. It's, it's only been decades that they've been Roman. And what they had imposed upon them, uh, it's, it's actually an ironic phrase, is the Pax Romana. Uh, so the Pax Romana is everything's peaceful as long as you do it the way we tell you to do it, and then there will be no problems. You know? And so that's, that's where um, Galatia finds themselves now. They have been... Uh, recipients of the Pax Romana and they uh, live in peace as it were because they accept their subjugation to Rome and as long as they accept that subjugation to Rome things are going to be fine. If they have some independent thoughts then things might not be so fine. Uh, as, I, as we do this we also notice a uh, transition of the church from being predominantly Jewish to predominantly Gentile. Now, at the time of the Galatians, we're not predominantly Gentile. We're not there yet. 
But when you, again, when you look at the books and the order in which they're written in the New Testament, not in the order in which we find them, there's different reasons why our New Testament order begins with Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, actually some of the last books written in the New Testament. Those, those are not arranged chronologically. Uh, there's a different reason for that chronology. But if we look at where they first came from, you're looking at the book of James, for example. Many people, when they read the book of James, say, I'm kind of even struggling to make sure that this is an explicitly Christian document. You know, it, it, it doesn't necessarily seem to really emphasize the passion of Christ. It doesn't, doesn't seem to emphasize some of the things that we would think of as being uh, Christian documents, uniquely Christian doctrines, which must be emphasized. And I, I would suggest to you that the reason why James reads that way is because we haven't hit the real controversies that are yet to come when you move from one ethnic Petri dish to another. Uh, what's happening is in James, the church is still Jewish. And so there's a lot of assumed teaching behind James. There's centuries of assumed teaching behind James. And James is assuming, at a minimum, a Jewish practice. At a minimum, he's assuming a Jewish practice. And he's talking to Christians who, in this particular sense, are kind of a subset of the Jewish group. So therefore, James does not address the questions that are going to become very important when the church begins to go into Gentile territories. Therefore, this move that we sometimes do, where we contrast James and Paul, it's wrong-headed from the beginning, and that's the reason why it's wrong-headed. James isn't addressing the issues that Paul is addressing. James is talking to a Jewish church. And he's talking to a church that doesn't argue with basic issues of ethics and morality. And so that's why in James, the big message of James is you got to do what's right. It's not enough just to hear the word. You have to actually put it into practice. Whereas in Paul, it almost, whether you see it as a step back or a step forward, I kind of just view it as a step aside. It's just different. In what you oftentimes get is you got to believe right. Paul's emphasizing how you have to believe because he's not talking to people who have centuries of belief in Yahweh. Uh, he's not talking to people who have centuries of being soaked in the Hebrew scriptures. He's talking to people from a different place and what he's trying to say to them is what you believe matters, okay? It's an issue in Paul and his writings. It is not an issue in James. And so in James, we don't really get a big issue of like you gotta believe right. I'm kind of assuming everybody believes right. In fact, the difference between Christians and non-Christians is not that much. You get into the Gentile area, Galatians, where we begin, now it matters. Now there's a conflict between people who have grown up in Judaism and become Christian and people who have grown up as Gentile people and become Christian. And we're certainly going to see that over the next six chapters. We're going to see that that conflict is real and that it matters. Uh, so, so James and Paul are not fighting against each other. They're back-to-back -back fighting in opposite enemies. Um, the, the one enemy is coming from a Jewish perspective where uh, perhaps we need to emphasize actually doing what the word pronounces. And then Paul, going the other direction, is saying, it matters what you believe about Jesus. You know, it really matters. I don't want to just turn you into ethically good people. You know, so he's not just teaching moralism when he comes to the Galatians, but he's actually teaching them stories, beliefs, truths about Jesus that must be accepted if we're going to be Christian. We're not Christian because we're good people. That's not what makes a Christian. It's this belief in the story of God, which is the core message that I started with here. It's that passion of Christ, okay? Okay. So now I want to I read those first nine verses of Galatians. Uh, as I do that, uh, I ask God that you be present and powerful in our hearing of these words. Paul, an apostle sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and all the brothers with me, to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, 
If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you have accepted, let him be eternally condemned. End for um, this morning. Why does Paul jump at them the way he does? Even from the very beginning, uh, people who have read Galatians have noticed this. John uh, Chrysostom was an early Christian preacher, and uh, he noted, and I think it's as good an introduction as any, he says, now that this epistle breathes an indignant spirit, is obvious to everyone, even on the first perusal. But I must explain the cause of his anger against the disciples. Slight and unimportant, it could not be, or he would not have used such vehemence. For to be exasperated by common matters is the part of the little-minded, morose, and peevish, just as it is that of the more redolent and sluggish to lose heart in weighty ones. Such a one was not Paul. What then was the offense which roused him? It was grave and momentous, one which was estranging them from all that came from Christ. Okay. So Chrysostom's pointing out, you know, when you start reading Galatians, you don't get very far before you catch this, what we would oftentimes call tone. There's a tone that comes through in these early verses of Galatians, and it's not patient, and it's not really, it's not really politely said. In fact, a lot of people kind of love these early verses of Galatians. Uh, these are some of the verses that I heard the most. Though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you, and it was applied to absolutely every belief you could think of. If there, was, if there was any sort of picayune belief that somebody was saying something about that was different, then we brought the curse of Galatians upon them. Okay, obviously, I, I hope you begin to see quickly how much that's ripping these verses from context. Um, Paul is not arguing about worship styles here. It's nothing like where we oftentimes have applied these verses. He is arguing against a teaching that pulls us away from the gospel of Christ. And that's the gospel of Christ writ large, not written legalistically and small. In fact, the further of irony of this is as we develop this letter, what we're going to see, a letter that has been called the Magna Carta of Christian Liberty, um, that what we're going to see is his essential message is this. Any departure from grace is a departure from the gospel. And that's what's bringing about the harsh language. And I say that that's ironic because in my experience, it oftentimes has not been grace-filled people who are quoting this verse a lot. But if you look at it in its context, that's what it is. I am astonished that so many of you are departing. And, and then you heard it. You heard what he had to say. And, and there's more. As we get into the, this letter, you're going to find even more rough language that he has for the people who are doing this. And yet we're also going to see that what he's emphasizing is that any move from grace is a move away from the gospel. And he doesn't want them to do that. Well, there's two main ideas, and uh, you know, there's, more, there's a lot of sub-ideas, but there's two main ideas that Paul, for the rest of his ministry, is going to face. Paul is such an important person in the New Testament canon, by the way, precisely because he's the apostle to the Gentiles. And so when we're talking to people who are like us and who share our same background, we have a lot of common things that we don't have to talk about because we all know them. We all share them together. And that's where James is. But Paul is doing that very interesting thing where he's going to talk to people now who do not share his assumptions, which makes you have to rethink and redefine everything. And so Paul in his letters is doing that. He's not taking belief in, in one supreme God for granted. He's not taking belief in Jesus for granted. He's not taking the uh, understanding of Jesus as Christ, Messiah. He's not taking that for granted. And so he's got to get down into some issues that James, living in Jerusalem, will never have to get into. But now Paul going into Gentile areas is having to get into these various things. And as that happens, as you can imagine, not everyone likes what Paul was doing. He actually gets opposition, not just from Gentiles, he gets opposition from the Jewish church. The Jewish church, the Jerusalem church, is going to be a thorn in Paul's side from this point on. Not necessarily the leadership of the Jerusalem church, but people who have grown up in the Jerusalem church and understand that. And they will dog Paul for the rest of his life, and they will follow him, and they will say a couple of things about him. There's some other things we can pick up in other places, but for the most part, they're, they're doing a couple of different themes. One, Paul doesn't quite understand or Paul doesn't quite deliver, doesn't really matter which, but he doesn't quite understand, he doesn't quite deliver the full gospel. 
Paul kind of gives you the first lesson in the series. So Paul's going about in, in the Gentile areas, and he's kind of giving them the first lesson of the series, but he's leaving, and he's leaving so fast that he's not telling them everything they need to know. And so when you want to get into the deeper things, when you want to grow deep, when you've got to really get to what it means to be Christian, then they're coming along to tell you what that means is you have to buy into the whole system of law that we have in the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, they don't always say that. They don't always say, you have to buy into the entire system of law. They don't always say that. But what they have is they've got a hot button issue. And that, this happens a lot with humans today. A lot of times there's a hot button issue. And how you, how you are on that hot button issue really says a lot about you. And the hot button issue at this time is circumcision. Now, Paul wants to point out, and he will point out later in this letter, that you can't choose circumcision and just pull that out of the law and say, we'll do the circumcision part, but we're free from all the other obligations. Paul's going to say, no, you can't do that. If you're doing the circumcision part, then you're in for all. If you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. And he says, you shouldn't be in for that. Circumcision is not something that is demanded. You do not need to. See, this is a hot question at the time. When I become Christian, do I need to first become Jewish? That is so settled in our minds that we've almost reversed it to can a Jew be Christian? But in the beginning, the question is going quite the other way. If I become a Christian, must I first become a Jew? Or is becoming a Jew part of becoming Christian? Paul is constantly having people follow him that say emphatically, yes, you must become Jewish if you're going to become Christian because Jesus is the Jewish Messiah and he is the culmination of of everything that the Hebrew scriptures are talking about. And so if you're coming to him, but you're bypassing uh, the Judaism, then you're bypassing the root and trying to go right out onto the branches or the leaves. And so we got to bring you through the root. You got, you got to get this entire thing. That's one of the things that Paul is facing is he teaches an incomplete gospel. A second thing that Paul faces a lot of times is this idea of that he can't stand up to opposition. This is really funny to me. Um, as, as you study Paul and as you look at his life, it's really, it's really kind of funny to imagine that um, during his lifetime that one of the very common slams against him was he's weak. He doesn't stand up well. He's not standing for the gospel. He's a compromiser. And so what he does is he goes into these areas where the people don't understand things as well as we do. And rather than insist that they understand the full gospel and they do everything they need to, he's constantly cutting corners and doing things to just make it for easy, for, to, easy for them to be Christian. But the truth of the matter is he's not really teaching them enough to be Christian. And so this is a really, really common slam against Paul. And we'll see it over and over is that he's weak and he's compromising. He's going into Corinth, and rather than going everything against what Corinth is, he's just going part of it. Into Galatians, he's just going part of it. Because he's weak, he gets, he gets sort of compromising when he's around people. And by the way, anybody that's trying to teach the gospel in a place other than where they literally grew up, I think, is easily open to this accusation from the home folks. Uh, the home folks are going to see that he's not saying it exactly the way we said it. Uh, he's not always emphasizing the things that we emphasize. And so rather than saying maybe he's got some insight that would help us, the easiest thing to do is to say he's a departure. It's not that he has insight. It's that he doesn't have strength. Um, it's not that he actually has something to say. It's that he's afraid to say what he knows he should say. That accusation is always there. It's been there. It's done to this day. Uh, July 3rd, 2022, I guarantee somebody's being accused of that. Um, that they just don't have the courage. Um, and and, and they're, they're going out and they're talking to some different people. They're compromising with them because they're just trying to make the gospel palatable. That's what was hounding Paul everywhere he went. At this early point in Paul's life, uh, or at this early point in his ministry, he has this fiery letter that he writes. If we were to continue to study just the letters of Paul, you're going to find that you don't really catch this tone again until the end of 2 Corinthians, in the last few chapters of 2 Corinthians. And the difference, one of the differences between Galatians and 2 Corinthians is that here in Galatians, he's just out with it. In 2 Corinthians, when he does it again, he keeps putting in these interjections like, I'm speaking like a madman, but you've made me do this. I'm talking like somebody who's out of my mind, but I'm actually not. I know I shouldn't say this. I should only boast in the Lord, but here. 
you know. So at least there, he's kind of recognizing, oh, boy, I'm really being harsh. But those are the two places where, where he really answers for himself is in Galatians and, and the latter chapters of 2 Corinthians. Why? Because when the gospel hits cross-cultural currents, it gets rocky. It gets tough. And, it, and, it, and we start to kind of struggle with what it is that's actually being done there. So this is basic, this is baseline. Let me just give you about um, six observations. Don't try to count them off because they'll probably kind of try to blend together. But uh, just, just some observations about this which might be helpful for us to think about or to at least kind of plant a flag in our mind. First of all, just from the history itself, this is the first thing. In the history itself, it's interesting that Paul writes to the, to the church in Galatia to the churches in Galatia, to the assemblies, if we were to actually translate that word, to the assemblies in Galatia. And Paul seems to write that, that he seems to think that writing to the churches of Galatia, that that's a specific enough address. You'll find that rarely does Paul really think in terms of what we would call congregations. He, he doesn't really define it the way we do. We come 20 century later and we define churches as kind of equivalent with congregation. Paul doesn't necessarily do that. In fact, in this particular place, there's a lot of cities where he has established Christianity. Acts 13 and 14, you'll see several. But he doesn't talk about any of those by name. He kind of talks about it by province. He's kind of talking about all the churches to Galatia. And so uh, I think there may be something there to note about just how we think of the church's organization. Um, and especially in a movement which is, emphasizes congregational autonomy as much as we do, it might help us to at least just think about being open to whether that's been an overemphasis. Uh, is, is that something that really comes from the pages of Scripture? Or is that something that comes from where we were uh, when we were being formed in the latter 18th and early 19th century, uh, where we were, you know, in, in politics in America? Um, you know, the local rule thing, uh, no central person from another place is going to tell me, uh, no taxation without representation. Just think of all the things that are written, and then at the same time, go look about how we talk about church government, and there's, there's a lot of the same feeling. You know, if you're from another place, you've got no right to say anything to me. And, uh, you know, there's, there's absolutely nothing there. Whereas in the church, or in the scriptures, a lot of times you see these attitudes of like mutual submission and mutual cooperation and support, and a lot of times it's not even really easy to define what we mean by an elder in a church. What does that mean? Does it, does it in a congregational standpoint? Is it in a city standpoint? When the elders at Jerusalem got together, was there one from Canal City and one from Park whatever and one from Hurricane and one from Cross Lanes? Is that what that meant? Uh, or did it have some other? It, it's unanswered questions, but it's things that a lot of times we never even question because working from one culture to another, we've already got those questions answered, so we don't have to think about them anymore. But if we were to go into another culture, we might have to start think about things like, what does it mean to address a church in Galatia? What would it mean to address a church in West Virginia? Or to address a church in Jamaica? Would that even be possible? Could we even do that? You know, it's just something to think about. Second, um, and that, that kind of blends, I, I put those two things together, but uh, the, the third one actually I wanted to talk about is look at how he describes this by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. The resurrection is going to be a central teaching from this point forward. In fact, if, if we go through Acts, and that's one of the things that I was thinking about doing, was going through Acts and just looking at that transition and looking at, there's, there's these different ways that the gospel is portrayed, but there's one thing that stays solid. There's one thing that never changes at all. It's not even communicated differently. And that is from the time that Peter preaches in Acts 2 to the time that Paul was preaching to purely Gentile people in Athens in Acts 17. The lodestar topic is the resurrection of Christ. That's the thing that always matters. They're listening to Peter along, oh, this is a good exposition of our Hebrew scriptures, which we are here on one of the high holy days of Judaism to celebrate. Here we are on the day of Pentecost, and he's given an exposition of the Jewish scriptures and talking about the Messiah that we all anticipate. Very, very interesting. And then he says, that Messiah is Jesus Christ, and you killed him, and he rose from the dead. He didn't have to go there, but he did. Same thing happens in Acts 17. Paul's preaching along in Athens. There are kind of going like, it's a good presentation. We're enjoying this. It's making us think. And we're, we're kind of following along with him. And then he says, 
that this God that I've been trying to tell you about has appointed a day of judgment, and he's going to do that by this person that he has nominated, appointed, set up to do it, and he's proven that by the fact of his resurrection. And then Paul lost his audience. Things didn't go so well after that because resurrection is such a central part of this. It just can't be left out. Resurrection is the bullseye of what we're talking about here. And at the very beginning of this, what is this, uh, this, this um, apostleship that Paul has? It's about the resurrection of the dead. God has raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the baseline big thing. Grace and peace to you from God, he says next. And that's that worldview that I talked about. Grace and peace is an easy thing for us sometimes to kind of just flip off of our tongue and not really think about everything that is tied up in that. Grace is a uniquely Christian greeting. Grace, uh, it's, it's wrong to say that grace doesn't exist in the Hebrew Scriptures, by the way. Uh, as, as we go further and further from the core, uh, I hope to get into that and to show you how graceful the Hebrew Scriptures actually are. But um, in the New Testament, it's not just there, it's emphasized. In Hebrew Scriptures, it's there, but you might miss it. You won't miss it in the New Testament Scriptures. Grace and peace. Now, what is peace? Peace is shalom. Peace is what the Jewish people have always been striving for. They've always been striving for peace. What they didn't realize is that peace comes about through grace, is that it's the grace of God that brings us to peace. Now, peace, as I mentioned before, peace is going to be a, a, a hot word for people in Galatia and for people all around the Roman Empire, because even then the phrase Pax Romana was used. And so, yes, we have in peace. Do you live in peace now? Yes, we do. You know, we oftentimes thank our God. We thank you for the peace that we have. And oftentimes, and I'm not trying to pick on anybody here, but I'm just trying to think about how easily we can slip away from central gospel messages. Oftentimes, we assume that peace was brought to us by certain governmental structures and by historical events that happened in the past, oftentimes linked to wars, and that that's what brought us peace. But the gospel is very clear that what brings us peace is the activity of Jesus. And that what brings us peace is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. And so when he's addressing the Galatians and remarking about grace and peace, he is not talking about the Pax Romana. It is not Caesar who has brought peace to this area. It is Jesus. It is Christ. And in the early languages, by the way, the Christ and the Caesar word are actually really close. close and you'll see that getting played with from time to time. It's the peace of Christ. It's not the peace of Caesar. It's the peace of Christ, which is being brought here. Uh, where do we think our peace comes from? Where do we think our order comes from? Uh, where is it that my life coheres? How is it that I have a good day today? Uh, you know, is it, is it, who am I thanking more? Am I thanking Jesus more or George Washington? You know, where is it that this actually came from? Did it actually come from that inner group of disciples who followed Jesus and then spread the gospel throughout the world, or was it the First Continental Congress? You know, where is it that I really center my identity? Who do I mean when I say we? Who do I mean when I say we have been given peace? And where is the source of that peace? For Paul, the source of that peace is God. The source of that peace is Jesus, and he doesn't want to move away from that. And that's why any move away from grace is a move away from the gospel. Now, he's, he's going to define this for us, not only in this letters, but in others. But just to, you know, calm our beating hearts and lower our blood pressures, grace does not mean having no ethics. Grace does not mean anything goes. Paul himself later will talk about ethical things. He'll say that we ought not to be caught up in the terrible things that this world does, but that instead that the grace of God has appeared, the grace of God has appeared, and did not say, by the way, anything goes, I'll forgive whatever, but says the grace of God appears teaching us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. So any understanding of grace that is divorced from ethics is not a biblical understanding of grace. Grace brings us into an ethical life. Grace brings us into where we ought to be living, but it also has it properly defined for us. I'm not saved because I pleased God and I did everything that he wants me to do. I'm saved by grace, and having been saved by grace, then what kind of person ought, ought I to be? What kind of person should a human being be who has received the benefit of Jesus' death upon the cross? That's our ethic. Our ethic is what kind of person should I be in light of what Jesus has done for me? And it's not flippant. 
It's not flippant about what I should do. It's deadly serious about what I should do because the cross teaches me how grave sin is. And so I'm very concerned about not living that kind of a life. By the way, ethics then does not mean salvation by law. It doesn't mean either of these things. Grace doesn't mean no ethics. And when we teach ethics, that doesn't mean salvation by law. Paul's going to be very concerned in this letter about people who are leaving grace and trying to be saved by what we today would call salvation by works. He's very concerned about that. And he's talking about what's happening in the way that they're being taught how to, to obey the old law. But he is still teaching grace, and he is still talking about ethics. In fact, towards the end of this letter, we're going to see that he does, he's got this great crescendo, sort of like the, the end of a fireworks display, where he says, here's the works of the flesh, here's the works of the Spirit. And so he's very concerned about those things. It's not that they have no effect. They do have an effect, but that's not what saves us. What saves us is this, this grace of God. I want to close with just Paul's self-descriptions. I think I've mentioned this to you before, but, but hopefully this is something that we can, can really kind of center upon as we close to get where Paul is coming from. You know, we've talked before about um, the Dunning-Curry effect, you know, like uh, the, when I don't know much about something, I'm pretty confident in what I know. But then once I learn more, I actually become less confident in what I know because I realize how much I don't know anymore. I actually kind of see that with Paul and Grace in his development in these letters. Look at how he describes himself from the beginning, verses 1 and 2, and we'll see this more next week. I don't take a second seat to anybody. That's, that's Paul in Galatians. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, and he's going to develop that even more. I don't take a second seat to anybody, he says. But later, in a letter that he writes later, in 1 Corinthians, which I think is kind of in the middle of his apostolic uh, regime, uh, his apostolic time, he describes himself in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 8 through 9, as an apostle who was born out of season. Okay, still an apostle, but an apostle who is born out of season. The others were there before me. They're first. Uh, I kind of came along later. And then towards the end of his career, he writes a letter to Timothy, telling Timothy about what he needs to do to sort of organize the church there at Ephesus. And in that letter to Timothy, he says that Christ has come to grant mercy to sinners of whom I am chief. Chief of sinners is how he refers himself at the end. I think what happens when we begin to understand the grace of God is in the beginning we might say, you know, I'm not that bad of a person. I've compared myself with other people and not bad, not bad. Maybe, maybe I've got some faults, but really not that worse than anybody else. God's lucky to have me. You know, we, we should go out and get more people like me. We go out, find people like me, and we can build this church. You know, that's, that's kind of the beginning. And yes, yes, I'm saved by grace. Of course I am. Because I'm not perfect, right? But unspoken is, well, I'm not that far from it. <laughs> you know, I'm not perfect, but I'm getting there, you know. And, and then in about the middle, we start to say, like, man, there's a lot of other people around here that, um, that I probably stand second to. You know, rather than comparing myself to all those lost and awful people, now I'm looking at the holy people and I'm saying, I still got some growing to do. You know, I'm an apostle, but I'm untimely born. I'm still looking at that. And then as we get even more into grace and we realize with, with clarity who we really are and what Christ has done for us on the cross and how much we owe our salvation to him, I think we get closer to saying, chief of sinners. There's a whole lot wrong in my life. I see a whole lot wrong in my life. You know, one of the things that's interesting about the gospel is it's first bad news before it's good news. There's a whole lot of people living in our world today that if you ask them what kind of person are you, they'd say, I'm a good person. And if you held up the typical uh, sort of moralistic, therapeutic deism that is taught in our uh, in our world at large where, you know, good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell, right? Like I say, that's in all the movies, whether they're Christian movies or not. Uh, every movie that addresses the afterlife has good people going to heaven and bad people going to hell. Where do you think most people in the world think they're going? They're pretty good folks, right? You don't meet very many people that say, I'm probably headed to hell. You don't meet that. Everybody kind of thinks they've got the standard. But once we come closer to God and we begin to learn more about him, we not only learn about his graciousness, but we also learn something about who we really are. 
And in learning who I really am, when the gospel first really hits me, my reaction is, what shall I do? Men and brethren, what shall I do? That's a reaction. I'm starting to see now who I really am. Not as a pretty good guy, but as a pretty needy guy, a guy that needs a savior. And I think as we move on and on in our Christian life, we don't become more arrogant about ourselves. We become more humble. Uh, we don't rate ourselves high on the spiritual ladder, but we actually begin to see ourselves as quite in need. Quite in need. Perhaps, perhaps, the most needy person I know inside of here, inside of these walls. Hate to let anybody know it, but I need more than anybody. We don't often go around and say that, but I think when we've walked long enough with God, that starts to happen to us. The arrogance starts to go away. The presumption that I can't be wrong. The presumption that nobody has anything to teach me. And that my ancestors, my spiritual ancestors, could not possibly have made a mistake or created an overemphasis or ignored something that needed attention. But actually, I begin to say, maybe I am a man of unclean lips and I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And what I need is a touch from God. Well, that's what Galatians is about. And uh, I look forward to continue to, to talk about Galatians with you. So to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you before his great presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. We're going to sing an invitation song now. If there's anyone that wants to make a public response, we encourage you, invite you to do that while we stand and sing. Over all the earth, you reign on high, every mountain stream, every sunset sky, but my one request, Lord, my only aim, is that you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams, in my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again over every thought, over every word. May my life reflect the beauty of my Lord, cause you mean more to me than any earthly thing. So won't you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me. Reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me. Reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? So won't you reign in me again? So won't you reign in me again? Before we have our closing prayer, just a quick reminder. The women's class on Wednesday, the men's class on Monday evenings, taking a brief break for summer. Uh, a lot of traveling going on. It's hard to get people's schedules together. So we will resume those. We'll, we'll announce those dates coming up. I assume it'll be sometime closer to Labor Day once the we get through the all the summer travel. So just uh, keep those in mind this fall. Um, the, I've been blessed by the men's class, and I'm sure that there's ladies that could attest the same. So uh, let's close in prayer. Thank you for giving us the blessing of a, of a people that want to learn. Thank you for the blessing of the lips that uh, gave us the sermon. Thank you for the blessing of the voices that sing worship to you. Thank you for that grace, Lord. Let us go throughout our days being cognizant and being uh, thankful, but also being forgiving to others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.